let's start ladies and gentlemen i have great pleasure in welcoming you to the 87th annual general meeting of your company and wishing all the shareholders their families and friends a better 1976 in every day well the director's report and the audited statement of accounts for the year ended 30th june 1975 have already been circulated in view of the provisions of the companies within bracket temporary restriction on dividends act 1974 the directors have recommended the maximum dividend permissible para as you will see from the director's report all other industries have done well except textiles since last year this industry has been in a particularly difficult position and the scheme of controlled cloth has added to the problem this particular scheme is not only adversely affecting the organized industry but also the handloom and power loom sectors which have to compete with the controlled cloth the spinning mills in the organized sector are especially hard hit because there is uh, no uptake from the handloom and power loom sectors in spite of a drop in cotton prices and yarn prices. Government to have started recognizing the distribution system so far as controlled cloth is concerned in my statement this by itself will not tackle the main issues what is called for is an upward revision of the price of controlled cloth and this will save the industry as well as the handloom and volume units in addition to the general problems of the textile industry our units both at dasna and hisar suffer due to shortage of power supply which has greatly affected the production and the profitability pattern when we met last on the 30th december 1974 our economy had just started recovering from the high speed inflation that was over to us since early june 1972 for the first time in the post independence period the rate of price rise was more than two percent per month it is only natural that government launched a concerted attack on inflation and from July 1974, a series of stringent measures were taken by way of partial wage and salary freeze compulsory deposit scheme. Restrictions on dividends, anti-holding and anti-smuggling devices, etc. I had occasion in my statement to you last year to give my thousands on some of the measures like the companies within the temporary restrictions on dividends act 1974 and the credit squeeze which was in operation since november 1973 i do not propose to repeat them again except to observe that unhappily my apprehensions have come a true pattern in the very nature of the things demand management anti-inflationary measures have in them the seeds of recession it is necessary therefore to be sensitive to the situation and took a view as to when an arrest in inflationary pressure would develop into a recession. I am afraid this important fact has not been appreciated by the authorities. So much so, several industrial units have closed down and many are compelled 
to hold excessive stocks. The profits of industry have generally come down and some undertakings are actually losing. But it has come to be said that there has been a transformation in our economy that we have moved from the position of shortages to that of surpluses that there has been a change in the consumer preferences or that there is a divergence between the old production pattern and the new requirements of the market. I have given considerable thought to this kind of opinion and I must express my disagreement pair. Apart from the fact that overwrite the tastes of consumer cannot change the overall production figures, do not tend support to the thesis that substantial surpluses have occurred, but a more fundamental fact is that a developing country like ours with one of the lowest per capita incomes in the world cannot suffer from overproduction. I submit that we have got to look to other causes for the malice. There, before I uh, proceed to outline my analysis, it is as well that I give a broad brush picture of our economy when compared to 1974-1975 did provide us with a number of favorable factors. In the last one year, prices declined by more than 5%. There has been a remarkable improvement in the agricultural output. Food grains production in 1975-76 will reach the targeted level of 114 million tons. The constraints which plagued us in 1974 like inadequacy of raw materials, power shortage, industrial disputes, transport bottlenecks, etc. have almost disappeared even so most of the industries are unable to take advantage of these favorable factors for the simple reason that the demand did not pick up there. I believe that the demand management policies of government have continued beyond their usefulness or necessity for instance credit expansion. In 1974-75, busy season was only rupees 982 crores as against rupees 1400 crores in the busy season of the previous year. Stop Mr. Vice Chairman said at the tag end of the discussion of the railway budget, I want to submit some important points with regard to the administration of the railways and the railway budget in which an increase in fares and trades has been proposed. First of all, said, I want to say that there is neither any dynamism nor any policy thrust in this budget. It has not shown any new direction to solve the questions facing the railway undertaking. It has used the general power or what we call the easiest way to increase by some percentage the railway fears and threats and try to solve the question of deficit finances, but it has not tried to tackle the basic malady which is afflicting the railways 
unless that basic malady is solved. I do not think the railway finances can be improved and its problems can be solved merely by increasing the fair and freight rates there. In this connection, sir, the economic survey has made certain observations I do not find throughout the budget that any attention has been given by the railway minister or the state minister to the observations made in the economic survey. Very important observations are made at page 22 of the economic survey and these are the conclusions of the economic survey on the performance of the railways in the last four years. The observations are there. Encouragement needs to be given to the movement of goods, particularly bulk goods by the railways. The share of the railways in the transport of goods appears to have declined. Reasons for the shift in traffic away from railways need to be investigated. Decline in the miscellaneous goods traffic is also of great concern. After giving these reasons, very pertinent observations are made in the economic survey further at page 22 and I am surprised to find that the railway ministry, ministry has not applied its mind at all to what the economic survey has to say on the administration of railways. I quote paragraph 3.25. At page 22 of the economic survey, the Indian railway system is more century old. The present network seems to have reached a plateau and is no longer in a position to meet the cynical fluctuations in respect of demand for its services. The system needs a farewell plan program of replacement of the aged rolling stock and track renewals in order to maintain an acceptable state of efficiency. Such a program should in fact be the first charge on the resources available for railway investment construction of new railway lines and other expansion schemes need to be undertaken only after satisfying the full requirements of replacement of aged rolling stock and track renewal spare. Sir, I want to submit to you that the railway budget shows that the income from the freight is rupees 3,600 crores and income from the fares is rupees 1400 crores and there is a decline of 3% in the freight income of the railways. Now the other thing which you will find from the railway yearbook is that the railways have got today the 32700 route kilometers of broad gauge I find from the railway safety report that derailment constitutes 81% of accidents. That shows the importance of the renewal of tracks in 1982-83 due to failure of equipment, rolling stock and track alone. There were 19% accidents even in 1983-84, it is 13.1% nowhere in the world railway accidents due to track and rolling stock are so high in number in the world. It is about 1-2% to 2 here. The percentage of accidents is so high because the ministry have failed to have proper rolling stock and track, you will find that income from railway passenger fear is practically one third. The income from freight and the ten is due to the bonded customers <coughs> in the 
export sectors such as coal and other goods which are transported by the railways. So far as mercantile community is concerned, they are not using railway transport at all. Even for long distances from Calcutta to Bombay or from south to the north, you will find the trucks and road transport are used for carrying bulk goods. That is why economic survey has said that efforts must be made to make rail traffic more attractive. There are, of course, many reasons and I shall not go into all of them. But the main reason is that proper delivery system is not there. There is a delay in the delivery of goods and there is corruption in procurement of wagons and wrong systems of the freight structure. If the railways want to make it a profitable concern, in view of the observations made in the economic survey, it is the duty of the government to explain what steps they are taking to make railway freight more attractive than what it is today compared to road transport pair. When Professor Mr. Eggs was the railway minister in 1979, in his budget speech, a suggestion was made that there should be national transport policy and a community called the BD Pandey Committee was constituted which gave a report. Stop. Thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to inquire about two or three things from the Honorable Minister through you. Madam, first of all, what about the casual workers working in the Indian Railways? According to the latest information, there are about 2.5 lakhs of casual workers working in the railways for the last 10 or 15 or 17 years. We have been pointing this out to the government repeatedly. The government should come out with a complete solution of the problem. What is all the more distressing to note is that the predecessor of the present railway minister added to the fleet of casual workers to the tune of 2000 in West Bengal alone. Now, without solving the problem of the existing casual workers, if you go on increasing the fleet of casual workers, that will aggravate the problem better. The other clarification that I would like to seek from the Honorable Railway Minister through you, Madam, is what about the local running staff in spite of repeated assurances from the government, the 10-hour working day has not yet been ensured. So far as the local running staff are concerned, I would also like to draw the attention of the Honorable Minister to the fact that a good number of local running staff are still remaining victimized. I would request the Honorable Minister, I would not like to advise because it is beyond my competence. I would urge upon the government to give a serious thought to these things and evolve a just and realistic solution to the problem so that the fate of the local running staff is determined in the right path. Pera. Madam, just one minute more. The number of railway accidents is still alarming in reply to a question 
the Honorable Minister of the State that there had been 38 coalitions, 62 derailments, 61 level crossing accidents and 21 fires on the trains in the Indian Railways during 1984. I need not go into the details of the causes behind this phenomenon. But I would request the Honorable Minister to put to use his know-how, which he obtained very recently, particularly as the Chairman of the Estimates Committee regarding the state of affairs in the Indian Railways. I would request him to put to use his know-how and take adequate steps, meaningful steps, so that accidents on the railways are curbed to a considerable extent. That is all. Thank you, Madam. But Madam, Deputy Chairman, I rise to support the two appropriation railways bills moved by the Honorable Railway Minister. Railway is one of the worst economic departments and anybody can travel from the route of the route to the saloon in a train. My, my friend said that the performance of the railways has a direct bearing on a large section of the people. The public is unaware that the railways are in difficulties mentally and physically. It has a labor force of 1.9 million people. There are 32,000 wagons in the Indian railways, which go on moving daily, and more than 9 million people are traveling in the Indian railways daily. Still, my friend who spoke just now said he was opposing the two appropriation bills. As I said, there are about 10 million people traveling in the Indian railways daily. From Salon to the Rook, there are so many Rook travelers. There are definitely merits and demerits in this many natural things will happen. I feel the railways should have the most sophisticated signaling systems with the latest electronic equipment. This should be spread all over to avoid fatal accidents in the railways. I feel that a large number of workers do not receive the attention of the railway administration. There is lack of attention on the part of the railway administration towards their employees. About 1.7 million people are working in different posts, in different workshops, and in open lines. There is no dialogue between these workers and the officers. The administrative machinery should be strengthened if necessary to provide opportunities for dialogue between the different categories of workers on the one hand and the administration on the other. Well, coming to thefts and decoities in the Indian Railways, if you analyze, you will find out that in most cases, the Railway Protection Force people are involved. We have seen that in most of the thefts and the coities, the railway security force people are involved. I request the Honorable Railway Minister to see that there is proper coordination at various levels so that this menace and inefficiency are stopped. Well, Madam, now I would like to say a few words about casual laborers. My friend on the other side has also spoken about this problem. It is true that the railways have the largest force of casual laborers. 
in 1980, there were about five lakhs of casual liver, though this figure has come down by now still. They have a force of three lakhs of casual liver. These casual liverers are exploited by the railway officers. Stop. Let's start. Madam Vice Chairman, at the outset, I thank you for giving me time for expressing my views on the railway budget. Then, Madam, much has been said by the honorable members on the railway budget and various suggestions have been advanced. I too want to express my views on certain issues pertaining to my state of Jammu and Kashmir. So far as the railways are concerned, there is a long-standing demand for a daily daytime train between Delhi and Jammu. It is a demand of the public and a demand of the state government because there is a huge rush of passengers from various parts of the country to Jammu from where they proceed to Kashmir. The number of pilgrims who visit Vaishnav Devi every year is 13 lakhs and 4 lakh tourists go to Kashmir every year. Besides, such a daytime train will benefit the state of Himachal Pradesh also, which has sacred sirens and tourist spots further since this train will have to pass through Haryana and Punjab. Both these states also will be benefited. Madam, such a daytime train is needed because it is a bit difficult for the passengers to have reservations as the number of passengers is very high and their names are on the waiting list for 10, 12 or sometimes even 15 days. So a daytime train will avoid the problem of reservations if my suggestion is not feasible then. I suggest to the Honorable Minister of the State for Railways that the present train known as Sarima Express or Holiday Express should be converted into a day time train. It will not involve any extra expenditure but solve the problem of the people of Jammu and Kashmir, state and Himachal Pradesh. But the second issue I would like to place before the Honorable Minister is the Jammu Udangpur rail link, which is under construction. The Foundation stone of this rail link was laid in 1983 in the month of January by the late Prime Minister Mrs. Indira Gandhi. At the time, the then Minister of Railways announced that this project would be completed in 1987. But after the lapse of two years and three months, even one fourth of the construction work has not been completed because adequate funds are not allocated. This year, there is an allocation of only rupees 1.07 crores for this huge project, which will involve, according to the present estimates, rupees 69 crores if one crore of rupees is sanctioned every year. The project will then take 69 years when the cost will go up to hundreds and hundreds of crores. Per. So this is penny wise pound foolish policy. So this is my request that at least rupees 6 crores should be sanctioned every year for the railway project linking Udarpur with Jambu.
and I also request the Honorable Minister to start survey between Udampur and Srinagar within bracket Kashmir for extension of the railway up to Kashmir. It will not cost much, only rupees 20 lakhs or rupees 25 lakhs are needed. Then about punctuality of the railways, the railways are becoming punctual. But again, I say that they are not punctual according to the wishes of the people, particularly the Jilab Express, which comes from Pune to Jombu, is something late by 9 hours, 10 hours. On one day, it was late by 13 hours. So punctuality should be the watchword of the railways. Then the catering system at the railway stations and inside the train is not up to the standard. It should be improved. Yeah. Another thing is that people drink inside the train. It is not hard. I have seen with my own eyes people talking liquor in first class, second class and air conditioned coaches also. The railway station has no authority to stop this evil of drinking inside the trains. They should be empowered, given more powers to stop the drinking habits in the trains. This is no sense for those who do not drink. I remember about a month back, one man was drinking. He offered me, I told him, I am a teetotaler. Then he gave it to a senior army officer. I asked him, he said, I cannot control it because I drink. This evil should be checked effectively inside the trains. Madam Vice Chairman, I rise to support the budget presented by the Honorable Minister of Railways. The railways budget which has been introduced in this house has generally to be welcomed better. The Honorable Railway Minister has presented a pragmatic budget by taking a realistic approach. He was under certain constraints and had certain compulsions. The financial health bequeathed by the Honorable Railway Minister would not have allowed sufficient funds to replace the over edge tracks and rolling stocks. 14,000 kilometers of track are overdue for replacement coaches, locomotives, bridges, signaling equipment need overall and replacement. In fact, the Indian railways are almost sick and therefore it is necessary to raise a further funds and invest them for all this purpose. Stop there. The Congress has always affirmed that political freedom acquires true significance only with the economic uplift of the masses. Mahatma Gandhi emphasized that the Swaraj of his dreams meant the poor man's Swaraj and the Purno Swaraj signified full economic freedom for the toiling masses. It is in recognition of this fact that during our freedom struggle, the program of the Congress was given a positive economic content. During this period, the Congress came to realize that the key to the removal of India's poverty lay in planned national development. The setting up of the National Planning Committee in 1938 under the chairmanship of Jawaharlal Nehru was an explicit recognition of the role of planning in transforming the nation's economy. Although purposeful planning had to await political independence. Even the Jawaharlal Nehru had the vision to point out that the foundation of India's planning must rest on the conscious acceptance that a free democratic state involves 
an egalitarian society in which equal opportunities are provided for every member for self-expression and self-fulfillment and an adequate minimum of a civilized standard life is assured to each member so as to make the attainment of this equal opportunity a reality these objectives were forcefully reiterated in his historic speech Christ with destiny on the birth of independence where he stated better the future is not one of case or resting but of incessant striving so that we may fulfill the pledges we have so often taken and the one we shall take today the service of india means the service of the millions who suffer it means the ending of poverty and ignorance and disease and inequality of opportunity the ambition of the greatest men of our generation has been to wipe every tear from every eye that may be beyond us but as long as there are tears and suffering so long our work will not be over there the setting up of the planning commission in march 1950 was a landmark in the evolution of our country's economic progress from the very beginning we have stressed that development must be related to the basic values and objectives of society and that in a country as poor as india social gain and not a private profit must determine the lines of advance to that end the pattern of development and the structure of socio economic relations were sought to be planned so as to lead to a rapid increase in production and to greater equality in the distribution of income and wealth stop there in this manner planning become inevitably linked with the establishment of a socialist society planning was to be an instrument to ensure that all a major decisions regarding socio economic relations would be made by agencies informed by a broader social purpose hence the leading role assigned to the public sector in our development strategy plan the speedy development of a viable capital goods industry was necessary to accelerate the tempo of development and to take us towards a self reliant independent economy recognizing the crucial role of science and technology high priority was assigned to the development and application of modern technology to process of production plan the nation's progress in this period of planned economic development is impressive during the last 25 years the country's economic structure has been greatly transformed industry has been so diversified that today we are virtually self sufficient in large variety of sophisticated capital goods and intermediate products thanks to the great for, uh, foresight of jawaharlal nehru india's reserve of technical scientific and managerial skills has expanded enormously per our recent achievements in economic energy and space exploitation are indications of the vast technical capabilities that now exist in the country the development of a large modern industrial sector and the rapid expansion of technical skills have really really sorry greatly helped in the transformation of the india's agricultural economy giving it a scientific tem- temper that some unfortunate and abnormal developments in the last 3 years have disturbed the rhythm of economic life an extraordinary combination of external 
and internal factors, the figures, influx, and the conflict with Pakistan, the severe drought of 1972-73, the international monetary instability, and the strong <coughs> upsurge, upsurge of inflation in the world leading to steep increases in prices of imported goods, particularly food, fertilizers and fuel generated an acute inflationary spiral in India during 1972-74 era. In part, the difficulties were aggravated because of pressures of competing demands of different sections of the population. In spite of our ex exhortations, it was generally ignored that the sectional interest of agricultural producers, manufacturers, traders, workers, and consumers were dependent on and must be balanced with the larger national good. However, as a result of a series of determined and politically tough measures adopted by the government since July 1974, the inflationary spiral was controlled and the general price level started declining after September 1974. I welcome the idea establishing an independent non-official research organization to undertake, promote and coordinate research in economic and industrial problems. It therefore gives me great pleasure to open the National Council of Applied Economic Research, this council with which the business community is closely associated and which the government have agreed to encourage will be of great help in the development of Indian industry. In accordance with our requirements and in the light of the latest scientific process in the context of our present plans and programs and in view generally of the past and rapid strides that industrial development is making all the world over. It is no exaggeration to say that the present is the age of technicians and economists. The researches carried out by this council on specific economic problems of current importance will provide the necessary guidance as also correct tips in the fields and methods of our expanding industries. In view of our development program for industrialization, I have no doubt a research institution like yours, which will link scientific discoveries and latest business methods with popular needs will be filling, <coughs> will be filling a long felt want pattern. The fact that it is going to be a private non-governmental research organization run on a completely non-profit basis will enhance its scope of work and general utility. Let me hope the service which it renders to the people, particularly the business community, will in course of time give to your council the rank and status of a full-fledged national research institute to pair. I have always felt that scientific inventions or the discovery of new methods in an sphere call for research work in order to be of practical use to the manufacturer and the consumer researches which remain confined to laboratories or textbooks can hardly be of any consequence to the people, fundamental or basic research valuable as it is in something like an industry's raw material which has to be processed in order to be turned into a finished product in more or less the same way. All inventions and discoveries have to be studied properly in order to be 
fitted into the framework of industry. I have no doubt that your council will be tackling this important task in a systematic and planned manner. Para. I have noted with considerable satisfaction that among the projects which your council pro pro proposes to take up immediately, the problems of small-scale industries have been assigned high priority before a gathering of <laughs> economists and industrialists and businesses experts like this. I need hardly dwell on the importance of the small-scale industries in the peculiar economic setup of our country. Suffice it to say that these industries not only supplement the basic or heavy industries, but are their essential adjuncts in our plan to step up production and raise the standard of living of the masses by increasing the national wealth. Heavy industries have indeed a big part to play, but any scheme which uh, fails to take into account our surplus manpower and our predominantly agricultural economy will not be able to achieve the said objective for the gainful employment of all available hands. It is necessary that cottage industries are encouraged and reasonable limits set to the process of mass production through total mechanization by reserving sectors or otherwise limiting cutthroat competition between hand power and steam and electric or automatic power. I am glad your council recognizes this essential fact and process. Investigate the problems of small-scale industries. I sometimes wonder if the time has not arrived for economists to pay more attention to production for consumption rather than for profit or in other words for marketing the rapid and phenomenal advance which industrial technique is making particularly in the field of production of power and rationalization of the mechanism of production makes it more and more difficult it if not impossible for backward and underdeveloped countries and nations to catch up with the advanced countries and it looks as if they can never compete with them on terms of equality if production is to be for marketing and not for personal or local consumption. A certain amount of exchange and marketing is necessary even in non-industrialized society but today the whole world tends to become if it has not done so already a single market for even the smallest and least significant and least essential of goods as much as for the most essential goods if industrially backward communities have to survive and proper in, uh, prosper in this age of cutthroat competition as between trader, trades and countries and nations, they have to think out, appraise their problems in the light of their own conditions and experience. Otherwise, the chances are that they will continue to be the happy hunting grounds. For all enterprising nations who cannot be blamed because they are advanced and because they succeed in competition in which the these advanced countries enter of their own free will and choice. Stop.